Last week, we were talking about what a religious belief is, to make that clear. And I was arguing that in its primary sense, a religious belief is a belief in something as the self-existent reality on which everything else that's not self-existent depends, ultimately depends. This week, we want to talk about how such beliefs impact theory making and explanations that we give for things. So I want to review very briefly the two views that are the more prevalent ones uh, in among Christians, among believers. And the, the most prevalent is the scholastic view that says that we have our religion on the one hand, theology, and then we take a look at theories on the other hand, and we try to harmonize the two. We take the two as independent sources of knowledge, try to put them together and link them up. But the, our, that means that our belief in God doesn't really impact the theory making thoroughly. It just impacts it at, the, at the junctures where they happen to bump into each other. And the rule there is Thomas Aquinas' view rule that Nothing in our theory may contradict anything in our faith. That's it. It's, it's, there's nothing more than that. And the other view was the fundamentalist view that we should look through Scripture to find our theories as though it's going to hand us views of you know, things like heat transfer and metal stress and other things that we want to make theories about. Both those theories have in common that they see the relation between our religious conviction, that is what we take to be the ultimate reality, the reality that creates all other realities, which we know to be God. And it takes that belief and wants it to impact our theory making in a direct way. We, we bring belief in God into a theory that's already made. Uh, some view of reality, for example, Aristotle's or Plato's. Um, and the fundamentalist wants to get the the view out of scripture and, and uh, have a direct relation between our belief in God and a theory. And the, what's been proposed by Dewey Rudd instead is an indirect relation. And that's the first thing that we have to make very clear. Religious, our belief in God, religious belief in that sense, what I prefer to call a divinity belief. Divinity beliefs impact theories not directly, but indirectly. And that works in a two-step process. The two steps are that our view of what is divine, the independent reality that makes everything else, gives us an outlook on reality, a general view of reality. And that in turn impacts specific theories in specific sciences. And it doesn't work directly, it works indirectly. And that's a very important point to make. It means that our belief in God can oftentimes act as a presupposition to something in a theory, just as we may criticize other theories for having unstated presuppositions. In fact, a presupposition may actually be unconscious to a thinker. A thinker may be assuming something and not have it even be conscious belief on his part. Um, and because that's so, and because the term presupposition has become very common as a way to explain this in reform circles. Um, I thought it was important that we uh, get straight exactly what a presupposition is before we go on. So um, I formulated a definition that I think can be helpful to us. Uh, Richard, if we could have that graphic. Uh, this definition becomes necessary mainly because the term presupposition has been misdefined. It ha one writer, I don't remember who it was, said a presupposition is a belief you hold no matter what. But presupposition doesn't mean have anything to do with the fervor with which we hold a belief. It has to do with the content of our belief in relation to the content of another belief. So um, if a belief has a presupposition, then the belief and the presupposition are not identical. The presupposition is one we would have to believe in order to hold the belief in question, but the presupposition does not entail it. It can't be deduced from it. And the presupposition is believed on different grounds from the belief that we are discussing. Uh, I think this can be helpful as a way to sort out 
the, this idea and distinguish it from uh, false ideas of it. Um, it's, it's, it becomes important um, in the work of the sciences and in the work of philosophy uh, where we're always probing and asking, what does this assume? What, what presuppositions are behind a particular belief or theory? So I thought that I would start with that, get it out of the way. <laughs> and now let's go back to uh, um, our previous session again. There I gave a, an example of how um, a believer, a Christian and a non-Christian can share the same world and see the same things and experience them and handle them at a level which doesn't involve this religious uh, conviction. It doesn't express it yet. And the example that I came up with was that uh, I'm sitting at the table with the materialist and I say to him, would you pass the salt, please? And he passes me the salt. That's because we both know what a salt shaker is. We speak the same language. He reaches over and passes the object to me. At that level, uh, our concepts are the same. Our concept of what it is for something to be a salt shaker. Here's a tubular container with holes in the top so on, he passes it over and I use it. But if I were to make further comment about it, and my, in my example, I said, suppose I say to this man, did you hear that our host paid $1,000 for this, this salt shaker? Isn't that the silliest thing you ever heard of? But he claims it's such a great work of art that it is worth it. And so he's paying here for its aesthetic properties. At that point, my colleague may say to me, well, it doesn't really have aesthetic properties. I mean, that stuff's a fiction. It has only physical properties. And then there we get to a level where our concepts do not agree at all. And in my, my concept of the salt shaker, it has all the properties it exhibits. They're all equally real. In his, there are, it really only has physical properties and the others are all fictions of our own invention. So that is, becomes a real difference. Um, now, what the reply is to this, a standard reply to claiming that belief in God impacts all kinds of theories all the time, is to say, but one and one makes two for everybody. It doesn't matter whether you're a Christian, a Buddhist, an atheist, or what you are. One and one makes two. And when we go to add up a column of figures, we all get the same conclusions. That again is like saying that we all recognize the salt shaker, that we have the same term for it, and we use it the same way. But my claim is that if you probe the concepts involved more deeply, you will come upon real differences. So, uh, these are the differences with respect to one plus one equals two. Probing that, we could ask further, what do one and two and plus and equals stand for? In other words, the old way to ask it is, what is a number? And it's long been an old joke that if you want to spoil the mathematics department's Christmas party, you lean over the punch bowl and say, what's a number? And then you'll be lucky to avoid a food fight. There are real differences in trying to answer that. And these differences are, are very important to mathematics and they are long standing disagreements that don't seem capable of resolution. A second question is Does the formula express a necessary truth? That is, is this a truth we can be confident has always been so in the universe, always will be so, and is so right now, but so far away we can't check on it? Now, how would we answer those questions? And there have been a number of theories, more than I'm going to list here, but I want to go through them briefly just to show you how radically different they can be. The first answer that was, is given to us was held as long ago as Pythagoras. You remember him from the Pythagorean theory and geometry class. <clears throat> Pythagoras, Plato agreed with it. More recently, the mathematician and philosopher Leibniz 
the inventor of the calculus, also agreed with it. And it postulates that there is a number world in addition to the world in which we live. The world in which we live is comprised of the things we see around us, tables and chairs, out the window there are trees, there are clouds in the sky and so on. That's our, the ordinary world of our everyday experience. But in addition to that, there's another dimension to reality, which actually contains, as its population consists of, numbers, their relationships, their fractions, their decimals, all the things that don't exist in this world that we never see. You don't ever see anything called the number one. You do see a numeral that stands for the number. Those are marks we make on paper. So according to these thinkers, such as Pythagoro, Pythagoras, Plato, and Leibniz, there's a number world theory with all the numbers and all the mathematical laws and all the truths that we never see in this world perfectly exemplified, and they all exist in another world. And that's the more real world. The populace of that world never changes. Those are eternal, self-existent truths that are true forever. Somebody asked Leibniz that question one time in class. That a student asked him, how do we know that one and one is always two and everywhere is two? And Leibniz's answer was, one plus one equals two is an eternal, changeless truth that would be so whether or not there were things to count or people to count them. That's the answer, is to postulate another entire world to help explain this one. And of course, the people who subscribed to this theory believed that the number world was, in part at least, responsible for this world. In Plato's view, the, the forms and numbers impacted matter so as to form this world. This world consists of imperfect things measured by perfect numbers. Um, Leibniz tried to Christianize that idea by saying that God created this world on the model of the number world. God's the great mathematician, and th this world is as close as he could come to making something that is intrinsically imperfect according to an mathematical order. That's one answer that's been given. The, there's another, there are others as well. You look at the second one on this list, it's the view of Bertrand Russell, a prominent mathematician of the previous century. Um, Russell held that math is just a shortcut way of doing logic. So we don't really need to talk about quantity and numbers and su such things at all. If we can, he actually proposed that this formula is actually a shortcut way of writing this one. And this is one he actually gave. And, and it's, it's lengthy and complicated, but it reads simply, there exists one thing U and another thing V and a set W. And U is a member of the set and V is a member of the set and U and V are not identical. And for anything, whatever, if it's a member of the set, it's either you or it's me. That, he said, expressed everything that one plus one equals two expresses, but it doesn't mention any quantity at all. And doesn't need to. Um, it, I don't, it's hard to know what to say when you're confronted with this because it's so patently wrong. No quantity. The, the first three symbols are in this formula are backward capital E's. You see them at the front of the end of it? And each one of them is read this way. There exists at least one U such that, and then the rest of the formula describes what U is, such that it's a member of the set W. Did you hear a number there? I did. There exists at least one and also in the formula itself, the very first thing says U is a member of the set W. That's the, what looks like a small e is a member of. 
but is a member of is just another way of saying is one member of. So quantity is all over the place in this, and he hasn't gotten rid of it at all. Let's go to another theory, the theory of John Stuart Mill. Mill actually held that all of our knowledge comes to us by perception. And so what we do when we say one plus one equals two, we formulate that. We're saying that every time we've seen one thing and another thing, it's made two things. All we know is that it's true the times we've seen it. We don't know that this is a necessary truth. We don't know that it's true right now, someplace far away in the universe. We don't know that it was always true or that it always will be. All we know is that it, the times we've seen it, it's been right. And so we generally think it's reliable and we count on it. But somewhere, right now perhaps, one plus one is making five and seven eighths, which would be odd, like finding a black swan, but not impossible. <laughs> Almost no one follows that view. <laughs> it's been expressed and been argued by Mill and other empiricists, but uh, it had very little grip on thought of people who do math and who do philosophy of math. Uh, it seemed just silly. Um, at any rate, I don't know of anybody that's going to put their body into a small capsule and be shot into space and believe that they're going to come back because all the math has been worked out. If that math is liable to change before they get home, they may not get home. It's not the way people rely on it. What comes closer <clears throat> to something people will, can hold is the pragmatist theory that arises in the, from thinkers such as Dewey and has more recently been espoused by the famous pragmatist Richard Rorty, who died just a few years ago. This is the view that says mathematics is not an eternal truth, a necessary truth, because it's not a truth. Mathematical formula are neither true nor false. They're tools that either work or they don't. It would make no sense for you to look at a shovel standing in the corner and ask if it's true or false. You could ask whether it's an adequate tool to dig the hole that you want to dig. And so the, the arithmetic, for example, is a valuable tool for adding up your checkbook, keeping track of what you've got in your bank account and what you've spent. It's not an adequate tool for changing the tire on your car when it goes flat. Tools just do a job. They're neither true nor false. And the question is, does it do the job it was invented to do? And that's all you can ask. That, that view of knowledge is one that won't stand scrutiny at all. And uh, in, I, in fact, uh, published an article on that a while ago and took Rorty some de in some detail to task for it. They can't make that fly. And people are still concerned with whether a statement is true not what, not just what job it'll do. In other words, they want to know what job it'll do because it's true. That's how we can rely on it. I'm just pointing these out now, not to go into great detail about what's wrong with each one, but to say these are examples of how one plus one equals two can be interpreted differently once we get past the surface part of our concepts where we all agree and start to dig more deeply into them, we come upon these differences. And they make significant difference. They have made differences in how people have said children should be taught arithmetic, in what arithmetic is. Is it just set theory, for example? And that was very popular for a while in what was called the new math. And then it was discovered that it ran into uh, very strong contradictions at points that could be made to fly and so on. Digging more deeply into our concepts, even such things as one and one is two, it seems to me is encouraged by that scripture that was read this morning before we began. In Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul doesn't say there, in Christ are hid all the information we need to stand in right relation to God. He said that many times anyway. Here he says more. 
not only treasures of wisdom, but knowledge. Somehow it's all bound up in the one who is the incarnation of God and who sustains all of creation, is the one in whom we saw last week's reading, all things hang together. So we should expect more from our view. We should expect not only that our view uh, impacts theories and theory making, but it somehow impacts them all. And that is something that the other two views uh, have struggled with. And scholasticism in particular can accommodate in its own view, accommodates more theories than does fundamentalism, but not all. I get uh, sort of facetiously mentioned two things we like to make theories about in physics. One is heat transfer and the other is metal stress. And if you ask a scholastic or a fundamentalist how belief in God impacts that, I think they have no decent answer whatsoever. It doesn't seem to impact it at all. And so the belief has grown up among them that while belief in God doesn't impact mathematics or physics or biology very much, when we get more into the social sciences, when we come to things such as economics and politics and ethics, there it does impact. It. So we have a two-pronged theory we, uh, of, of how belief in God relates to all the different areas of knowledge. One is that it doesn't do much with the natural sciences, and the other is that it does a great deal with what are called the social sciences. And it should be clear that not only is Dewey Rudin's proposal here that it's a two-step process. That the view, our view of God impacts our view of reality, and that in turn impacts the specific sciences, but it also that it impacts them all directly, all indirectly. None are exempt. There is a Christian interpretation of heat transfer and metal stress, and I've just given the illustration here for one plus one equals two. It impacts math in exactly these ways. And if you say, well, then what should the Christian view of math be? Very briefly, numbers represent the quantitative properties of things in the world. God has created a world in which there really are quantity. There, the world has quantity. And there are relations between the quantities. And these we, dis we discover rather than invent. And we discover them and formulate them into laws. And that's what enables us, us to do calculations of it. Non-Christian thought has tended always to look on math either as eternal, changeless, and self-existent in the way our number world theory boys did, or purely our own invention really doesn't talk about anything at all. The fact that it's useful at times is a great mystery. Anything but the truth, anything but that, yes, this is one of the kinds of properties and laws God has built into creation, and it's there for us to investigate and discover truths about. <clears throat> I've uh, taken most of my time already, but I just want to say briefly, the same thing can be said for atomic theory in the 20th century. There have been three major and different interpretations of atomic theory in the 20th century. Does everybody accept that there are little things called atoms that combine to make molecules, and molecules combine to make objects that we see? Yes, at that level, everybody agrees. But when you press further and you begin to ask, but well, what is an atom? What are subatomic particles? The first view of the 20th century was that of Ernst Mach. Mach is a man whose name you have heard of, though you may not realize it. And that's because the speed of sound was named in, our, in, in honor of him. Speed of sound is Mach 1, double the speed of sound is Mach 2, and so on. And if you like racing cars, there's the Mach 5. At any rate, Ernst Mach was probably the most influential atomic physicist of the late 19th and very early 20th century. And Mach actually held that all we know are our perceptions, the view very, a view very like that of John Stuart Mill. And so Mach held that uh, atoms and subatomic particles are, and this is his expression, useful fictions. There are no such things. 
I'll give you a moment to take that in. That's what he held. He said that uh, belief that they're real objects is just silly. We don't know that. All we know are, are our perceptions. So we know that if we take, we have five pounds of plutonium and five pounds of plutonium, put them together and explode some dynamite, then we're going to see one huge reaction. Well, of course, we won't, wouldn't see it for very long if we were too close, but there's going to be an atomic reaction. We, do we know why? Well, no. This is just a story we make up and tell ourselves about the interactions to the atomic particles and setting off a, a fission reaction and getting a an, an huge fireball and a great shock wave and so on. That's all part of the fictions. Einstein, who is also a, an atomic physicist, held no, atoms are real, but purely physical objects external to us. Our minds contain only perceptions, Mox right about that. But from the perceptions in our minds, we infer that there are purely physical objects outside our minds. Do we know that the purely physical objects are there for sure? Einstein said, no, that's the physicist's faith, that there are objects around them, that there are really objects outside of our own minds. That's pretty goofy. And it also runs up against the materialist view of what those objects are. They're purely physical, thought Einstein. And Doyward argues very forcefully and convincingly but no one can form a concept of anything as purely physical. You can say the words, but you can't do it. Finally, there was another view that came along that replaced Einstein's, and that's the view of Werner Heisenberg. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail, except to say this. In Heisenberg's case, he claimed that what was external and real and ultimate were eternal laws of motion for matter. Eternal laws of motion. And that they are mathematical laws. It's the math that predicts motion that's eternal, reliable, and the ultimate reality. In fact, Heisenberg actually said, after making that claim, he says in his book, Physics and Philosophy, this view fits with the Pythagorean religion. It's a piece of Pythagorean religion. The Pythagoreans thought numbers were the divine entities that made everything else. They were self-existent, and their combinations made up other things that were not self-existent, which came into being and passed away. I won't belabor that because uh, my time is about gone, but I will say that next session, what we intend to do is take a look at how uh, belief in God impacts a theory of what the state is, a theory of how it should be governed. And for that, we will first consider a couple of parts of Joy Reard's theory, namely the difference between parts and holes on the one hand and subholes and superholes on the other. And we'll look, look at a theory of society called sphere sovereignty. When we have those two points tucked away early next week, we can then look at how his theory of the state of government differs from other non-Christian, non-theistic theories. Brief recap for today. We tried to say that belief in God impacts theories in a two-step process, not directly, but by view, impacting our view of the total nature of reality, and then that view controls how we make theories in different scientific areas, such as math or physics or government. We looked at a number of different theories of one and one is two, just to illustrate how different they can be and that their differences are serious, and all the differences go back to what the thinker thinks is the divine reality. Is it the number world itself? Is it mathematics instead of number? Is it sensory perceptions instead of mathematics? 
or is it that we just invent it as a tool? It has no reality other than as a part of our imagination. And then I tried to illustrate that the same thing happens even with respect to atomic theory, just to show you again that yes, there is an impact of religious belief upon theory interpretation. Understood? Christian doesn't have to have a different theory from atomic theory, but should have a different interpretation of it from a materialist, an idealist, a pragmatist, or whatever is you might want to pick. So I think I've uh, taken more than my share of the time and we'll throw the uh, session open to questions. <laughs>